So welcome everybody to week two. Great to have everybody back on board again. I hope you enjoyed week one as much as, as we did. Um, certainly three fantastic wines with the two champagnes and the Chablis. Um, as always, a couple of introductions to make. I'm Luke, uh, one of the senior wine brokers here. We've got Mark Faber, our head wine buyer and pretty much our human encyclopedia of wine. G'day, Mark. Well, we all hope you're all enjoying this lovely, uh, lovely balmy Sydney evening. Um, so I read the other day that more people have been sent to space than have their Master of Wine badge. I'm not sure if that's true or not, but um, it's always uh, a privilege to have Alistair calling in from the UK. So good morning, Alistair. Good morning. Great to be here. As I've just said, I'm, uh, I'm excited about this one. And um, I think that is true about the, the space business, but um, <laughs> I'm happy with my feet on the ground and the glass of wine than being in space anyway. So. Fantastic. Now for wine number two, we've got a very special guest, um, Stefan Fulin Arbelet. Stefan is the head winemaker at Chateau Merceau. And Stefan, I know a lot of people can't wait to get into wine number two, which is the Shams Merceau evening, uh, Merceau. So really looking forward to getting your insights this evening. Good, good evening, everybody. Very happy to be with you today in this lovely countryside in Merceau Perrier. You, you can see, I will explain to you after, but we are right in the center of the, the best premier cru of Merceau. Fantastic. What a, what a treat. And then finally, we have Jane Moore. So Jane is looking after our Facebook feed. She's also handling all the texts that come in from the, the wine competition and basically keeping the wheels turning for the hour. So welcome, Jane. Hi, everyone. Brilliant. So just a, a quick introduction. We've had a lot of um, feedback over the last couple of weeks um, asking about food pairs. And not to this point, we've reached out to our friends at Frenchie's Barissery um, to basically create a special tailor-made menu to match to each wine. Now we're offering this for week three and four for unfortunately just all Sydney clients to start off with. Um, I've had Frenchies before, they're absolutely lovely. They're super easy. They make all the food for you, uh, deliver it to your door the night before, and then you just heat up on the, the nights of the tasting. So if that's something that you'd be interested in, in doing, what I'm going to do is send an email out to everybody um, after the tasting with a breakdown of the food the, and how they're pairing with each wine, um, breakdown of the cost, and just reply um, and we'll get that all set up for you. So, you know, if that's something that you'd like to explore, fantastic. Yeah, um, we didn't now, you guys have got, uh, you've, a lot of you have already got your food ready there, but uh, if there's anything that we can uh, assist with, do let us know, yeah. Brilliant. So what everyone's been waiting for the reveal of the leaderboard for the Wheel of Wine. Mark, if you could just bring that one up for me. There we go. Um, Le Tour. So well done to the people in the Maya Jean, the yellow jersey. Uh, four points was the, the highest total last week. So that was uh, one incorrect and, and one correct. So well done. And of course, this week, uh, we're running another two questions in between each wine. So just to reiterate, um, please text in to the number on the screen with your name, your email, and your answer. One, one incorrect answer gets you one entry. A correct answer gets you three entries. We'll be spinning the wheel of wine at the end of the night for your favorite wine. And of course, the guys on top of the leaderboard at the end of the four weeks get a special bonus prize. So it's all to play for and, and quite exciting. <laughs> Um, so just finally, um, uh, I say it every week, but you know, we really mean it. We want them to be, we want these tastings to be as interactive as possible. So feel free to unmute anytime. Um, give us your tasting notes, your comments, your questions. If you're not too comfortable doing that, please use the comment box as well. Um, we'll feed those questions into the experts and, and get them answered as soon as we can. So, um, that's about that. Now, just whilst everybody is pouring wine number one, which is the Riesling this evening. I'd just like to make a quick introduction to Michael Morgan. Now, we're all really excited to have Michael back on board at United Cellars after a, a period of time spent in Europe and London. And Michael, I'm gonna hand over to you to briefly introduce us to United Cellars Marketplace. Luke, yeah, as, uh, as Luke just told you guys, I uh, 
did a little three month jaunt around Europe, followed by 18 months working in the wine sector in the UK. And I'm really excited to be back at United Sellers because we're launching a new program, which is called United Sellers Marketplace. I think you might even be able to see that there's a little slide up for you right now. So the whole idea with the marketplace is that we're looking to try and buy wines from our great customers and from private sellers and then sell it to people that are looking for aged wines. So the way that I can help you is really with wines that you've aged for a specific period of time, but you've decided that your tastes have changed, you've got no space left in the cellar. And what we're doing is that we're offering you really fair prices to try and move these wines for you. So um, the whole idea behind it is to keep it simple, to have it personalized to you and to give you pretty fast results. If you'd like to learn a little bit more about it, I'm gonna stick around at the end of the tasting to answer any questions. Um, but other than that, I think we should probably get stuck into the first wine, shouldn't we? Fantastic. I definitely That's agree. So idea. just to, to recap over last week, we spent uh, a bit of time in Champagne with the Jacquinot and then the Brut Nature Rapier. And then we dropped down into Chablis with that beautiful Premier Cru Monte de Tonnerre, which looking at the feedback and, and certainly the reorders on that wine was, I think, the, the wine of the night. Um, so having a look forward at what we're going to be doing uh, this week. Firstly, we're going to be looking at Alsace through the Trembach Riesling. We're then going to swing into to Burgundy. And then finally, we're going to finish off in Beaujolais. So three very promising wines that I can't wait to get into. And without further ado, I'm going to throw over to Mark. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Luke. And thank you to all our amazing guests this evening. Uh, this has really been quite an incredible production to put together. I'm looking incredibly forward to enjoying a few glasses of wine and talking about these wines. So first of all, here's just a, a basic map just to give you a bit of the geographical location of where we're visiting this evening. So you'll see here Paris, uh, obviously the capital of France, and then we, we go to the east. So just here, uh, the capital of the region is Strasbourg. This is, this is the area of Alsace we're going to be talking, I'll be talking about now. And as we said here, we're going to be moving here towards kind of Dijon Bone, and uh, that's, that's Burgundy down there. And then down past the Macon, a little bit further down there is, is, um, is Beaujolais. So I'm gonna be talking to you about Alsace this evening. Now, Alsace is one of my personal favorite regions of France, and it is quite a fascinating place to visit. Now, uh, a show of hands, if I may, for uh, those of you who have tried a wine, any kind of wine from Alsace before. One, two, a lot of hands down here. Ali, yeah, you don't count, sorry. <laughs> uh, there's a, there's a, lot of, a lot of people who have not tried wine, the wines of Alsace before. Now, that's, that's, that's fantastic, first of all, because it means that we get to introduce you to, these, uh, to this incredible wine. The one you've got in front of you is, of course, a Riesling, a, a great variety that we in Australia know very, very, very well. So I'm just going to show you quickly uh, something here. Uh, th these are the basic regions of, of Alsace. As you'll see here, it is a very, very thin region, north, and it runs north to south. And it actually is incredibly isolated, very, very isolated. So I've, I've put a few facts about Alsace here on, on my screen, but I'll just run through them quickly. It's been, fascinatingly, it's been switched hands between France and Germany seven times in the past 400 years. Now that's going to give you a pretty unique picture, uh, a unique region. And, and within it, if you ever visit Alsace, and I strongly, strongly, strongly encourage you to do that, you'll see that it's neither French nor German. The food, the architecture, the language, and of course what we're seeing tonight, the wines, are incredibly unique to that region. And they really are a bit of an argot, a bit of a, a bit of a blend of those two cultures, uh, which are, if you think about the German culture and French culture, they're very, very, very different cultures. So the coming together of that has created an incredible mix. So it, it's quite unique in the fact that on one side, on the, uh, on the western side of Alsace are the Vosges Mountains. They're quite high and, and they protect the region from a lot, of, uh, a, a, lot, a lot of rain. And then on the east side is the Rhine River. Very, very powerful, strong, enormous trade route of a river. So the whole place is basically cut off from both sides. 
So one, one thing that was quite interesting as I was going through the history of this is that whilst it was taken seven times, it was then taken back because no, no region could really hold it for much for very long because they'd get isolated from the other side. So it, it's a fascinating, fascinating area to, to visit, of course, but also but we'll, we'll be doing as close as we can by visiting with, with the grapes. So I wanted to say a few words about Domain Trimbach. So Trimbach has, was established in Alsace in 1626. So they've, hopefully by now they know what they're doing. I'm guessing they do. They are then the head winemaker there is now a 12th generation Trimbach, 12th generation winemaker. And they have a very, very long history of producing very high quality wines. Now, uh, there's records of that going back to, um, it was the International Wine Fair in, I believe it was in, in Belgium, in the Benelux region. This was in 1898. They won the best wine of the world. Now, that's, uh, that's quite, it's quite, a, uh, quite a, an incredible achievement. And I believe at the time they were still part of Germany at the time. And they, they won it with a wine that Trimbach still makes today which is incredible. Over 120 years later, they're still making the same wine, which is called uh, the Cuvée Frédéric Emile. So today they own 40 hectares of, of, of grape growing wine, uh, of, of vineyards. And, and that is quite unique in this area, which is basically a, a region of almost entirely kind of smaller, uh, smaller holdings. It's quite similar in that sense to Burgundy, where there's lots of smaller guys who have, have tiny little vineyards. Now, the, the landscape, as Luke's showing here in this amazing, amazing Google map, the landscape is very, very harsh. It's, it's up against the Vosges Mountains. It's incredibly steep. The mountains there are very, very steep. They're known for, um, for mountain climbing. And indeed, there's a, a producer that I met many years ago who um, his family own a vineyard that is known as, not known colloquially, they have actually called their vineyard the Calf Breaker. It's, a, it's an in incredibly steep vineyard. Definitely and this, of course, like it. <laughs> and it's, it is incredible. So it, now, Trimbach own, they own more than 50 parcels of land spread across six different villages north to south within Alsace. And, but it, on top of that, they also buy a lot of fruit. Uh, to, and, and that makes them, they are actually the biggest producer within the region of Alsace. So for, for anyone that we're going to hear about in Alsace, these are going to be the guys that you're going to hear about. So that's why we thought we'd do it with one of the best known names. Now, as you're tasting it, and I hope you are tasting it now, I can see several of you tasting it, it is... Um, it's not Australian Riesling by any stretch of the imagination, but nor is it German Riesling. So Alsatian Riesling is or was very, very unique in that it has always been, or, or historically for the last kind of 50 to 100 years, it has always been dry Riesling, which Riesling is obviously the grape variety most notably from Germany, uh, also grown in, in um, all throughout Austria, but all throughout Germany, the, the styles of, of Riesling are always tend to be quite, they've got some sweetness to them. They've always got a, a level of sugar in them. In fact, the quality levels are often like the Spätles, Ausles, Trockenbier and Ausles. Those are all based around the sugar levels within the wine. Then you cross the border here into Alsace and it's about dryness, about dry Riesling. You definitely can get sweet wines from this area. However, the, the Riesling, and especially this Riesling we're trying here, it's, it's more in, in line with what we are used to in Australian Riesling. Now, Alistair, I, I, what, what are you finding in this one? Obviously, you've tried so, a Australian and German. What are you picking up through this? Good question. So, I'm, I, first of all, I get a lot of citrus, which is, which is absolutely bang in line with, with Riesling from no matter where you grow it from, you're going to get citrus in Riesling. That's just one of the hallmark characteristics of Riesling. However, with this, I get a really, really clear apple character. I get kind of almost like bruised yellow apple in this wine. Um, there's a little bit of floral character, but there's also a kind of earthy, 
almost savoury wet wool lanolin character in this wine, and that is absolute hallmark of Alsace. If ever I'm doing a blind tasting and you, and you smell something like this, this really does smell very, very distinctly Alsatian. So. You've, got, you've got the 2015 vintage there, haven't you? I, um, yeah. I, I, I've, got the, I've got the 17 here because I couldn't find the 15, but I have had the 15 before. And 15 was a particularly concentrated warm year, wasn't it? And I think the alcohol levels in, in, in the wine you've got is, is more sort of 13 and a half, mine's 12 and a half. But for me, that character you're talking about, Mark, which is that um, earthy thing for me, and I get this not just in Riesling from, from Alsace, but as well in the Gewurz and the Musket and the Pinot Gris that they make, is that is, is almost a mushroomy character. Um, I don't know if you can pick that up on this wine, but often with Alsatian wines, you do get that mushroomy character as they age. Absolutely, yeah. So I'd, I'd love to hear the feedback on this. For many people, I'm guessing this is going to be your first Alsatian Riesling. Um, Als Alsace is also the home of some other really, really unique grape varieties, such as Gewürztraminer, um, which, which is kind of... Had a bit of a had a bit of a growth spurt uh, as um, as Asian food went around the planet. Gewurz Tamina is is incredibly good with Asian food. However, I would say, I mean, the one thing that I must point out is the fact that the food, the the wines of Alsace are, dis, are absolutely meant to go with food. Mm. And one one thing that not a lot of people know is that the the region the the region that Alsace sits within has the most number of Michelin star restaurants of any region in France. So even more than the city of Paris. Strasbourg, the capital of the region of Alsace, has more, uh, has more Michelin star restaurants than Paris. So it, it's incredible, but they absolutely love the food. And when you taste ones like this, when you taste that rich, like I said, that bruised yellow apple character, that kind of roundness, it, you can see why that would go really, really well with food. Uh, Mark, this I'm, I'm really yep, keen to, to open it to the floor. Um, why don't we pick on someone? Team Leg, what are your thoughts on the Riesling? <laughs> well, we like it very much, but we don't, we don't taste apples, so I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. Mark, Mark, we're clearly not up to your standard of... Uh, <laughs> Uh, that's all right we'll get there we'll get there <laughs> so it's um i mean the, the acidity in this wine is an absolute key as well you can you can feel that really that zippy bracing acidity which again is an absolute hallmark of riesling and that again that just that nails down the point that it's so good with food this i mean one of the specialities of of the the, the region of us in Strasbourg in particular is is, is pork they love their pork and being, you know, with German history, that makes perfect sense. And this with pork is just godsend with, you know, pork and apple sauce is just an absolute godsend. So, uh, A question, Mark, from Facebook. Um, sure. You mentioned that um, Alsace is really famous for the dry Rieslings. Um, does, is there any residual sugar left on this Riesling at all? So this, this, this one we had, as, as Ali mentioned... Mark, I'm, I'm going to have to interrupt you. We're getting a little bit of feedback off your microphone. Sorry about that. Um, Ali, if it's okay, I'll throw over to you. And Mark, you can just sort the, the mic issue out. I'm not sure if anyone else was picking that up. Certainly Jane and I cool. were. Um, well, what was that the question about the residual sugar? Does this one have any residual sugar? Oh, actually... Every wine has a bit of residual sugar left. Um, sort of normally you, you have around two grams per litre in, in a white wine would be about right. But yeah, this, this, although it tastes bone dry, this does have, I believe, about five, five grams of residual sugar. But the key with these wines from Alsace is that they can actually seem bone, bone dry, but have some of that sugar. But it's because the acidity is so racy, um, as you'll know from Riesling, that it can, that it can carry it so well. So I believe this wine does have about five grams of residual sugar. I'm not sure if that's 100% right, but this, this normally does have around that much in, in the Trimbuck reasoning. How, 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 how is that, that guys? That, is that a better look? Sounds like you're in a UFO, to be honest with you, Mark. Sounds like you're in a UFO. <laughs> yeah. um, Stephen, I'm going to throw to you if that's okay. Stephen Colmer, the Colmers. Um, what are your thoughts on these wines? Hello. Um, I think 
Hello, hello. Um, we have actually been to the region. Um, we know their wines. We know Trimba. We've actually been fortunate enough to have been to the vineyard. Um, I really do like their style of Riesling. For me, it's just a little bit fruitier than, say, what I think is the equivalent um, German style. Um, both dry, both kind of bone dry, but I think it really carries its lemon and lime fruit really nicely. I get secondary tones of that kind of carasini, which I really like, which is much more common with Clare Valley. That's a really nice Riesling. Beautiful. Yeah, Thank you very wines. much. Um, so whilst Mark is sorting out his, uh, his microphone, I think we should probably move on to text in quiz question number one. Um, so relating to our next wine, uh, well, the, the region at least, um, wine-loving emperor Napoleon Bonaparte once said, in victory you deserve champagne, in defeat you need it. Aside from South Africa's Vin de Constance, what was his other preferred drop? So remember to text one, if you think it was the wines of Chambaton, two, wines of La Romanie, three, wines of Montrachet, or four, wines of Eschazo. So remember your name, your email, and just that number, so Jane can sort them nice and easily. Okay, I think, I think I'm back. Is that a little bit clearer? You are back. So much better. Excellent. I've just literally pulled out my expensive and flashy looking microphone. I've just pulled it out. So it's, uh, it's, now, it's now just, just running on the, the good, old, good old mic of the, uh, of the computer. So hopefully that's uh, a little bit clearer for everyone. The, I've, just, I've just seen, if you don't mind, I've just seen a couple of quick questions that have come in. Um, from um, first of all, Nick's asked about the the, the sugar levels. Um, I might be. I'm, my guess is this could be five grams per liter. Could be six. Um, I wouldn't think it'd be any more than six and a half. But I, I can check that. Actually, I'll have a, a check in a second. And you've asked me quickly. Um, what, what's the effect of acid on the perception of sugar? Um, it it really is. You know, the higher the acidity the less perceptible the sugar is really. Um, so a wine, if you have a wine, um, let's think of a great Sauterne, they have about 150 grams per liter of sugar, but they also have very, very high levels of acidity. And if you don't have the high acidity, um, then wines can feel very um, cloying. And so that acidity is essential to keep the vibrancy. So the higher the, the, the acidity, the, the, the more you can, the more sugar you can take as well. Briefly. And then uh, we've had a question from, I think, Francesco, how well this wine will age. I would say this wine will age, yeah, at least some, uh, we've had, a, like says, eight to 10 years, definitely even more. Um, I'd say 15 to 20 years as well, possibly. So uh, I, I'm going to jump in for a second because I had a little bit of a look on the Google machine and I'm pretty sure what, it's only about two and a half, 2.4 grams per litre of residual sugar in this one for the 15. Yeah, yeah, it's very low, very low. And I think that that's sort of one of the reasons that you can see so much of that powerful citrus character that comes through. Great stuff. So that's, uh, that's been a minute. Hope you got your, your, your answers in there. We'll be um, getting everything together for the end of the evening. Um, so moving forward, hope everyone loved that one. We're going to move into wine number two. So Stefan, we're going to throw over to you in the vineyards of Merceau. Absolutely gorgeous. Can you hear us, Stefan? Are you there? Yes, you hear me? <laughs> We're hearing you loud and clear. It's okay. So, uh, good, good evening again. I'm very happy to be here right in the Meursault area. Uh, as you know, we are uh, in Bur Burgundy region. So, it's a fabulous region because very small region, but very well known all around the world with the famous Romane Conti or the famous Montrachet. Uh, just to be precise uh, concerning Chateau de Merceau, Chateau de Merceau is a very, very old property. We are talking about 1,000 years of history. I think you are going to see on, on Google Earth, uh, during my, my purpose, you, you will see uh, the cellars. Um, but what you can see is on the background, over there, you have the village of Merceau. And just for you to understand, Merceau famous, but very small. We are talking about 1,400 people living there. And behind me, you are in the Merceau area. This is our, um, our vine of Merceau Perrier. 
one hectare of Perrier. And behind me, you have the village. You can see on the background, the village of puligny Morachet. puligny Morachet, uh, it's just 350 inhabitants. Yeah. So you, you can imagine that it's very, very, very small villages. In Burgundy, all the, 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 the villages are very small. I'm from Alos Corton, we are, we are about 140 people, uh, it, which is very small, but all is done around the, the wine and the, and the vines. Uh, regarding Chateau de Meursault, we are talking about uh, 1,000 years of history and six, uh, 67 hectares um, in each very good village from Alos Corton in the north to puligny Morachet here. Um, so we are doing white, <laughs> wine like Merceau but also red wines and all the wines we do are uh, coming from our vines we don't uh, purchase we don't uh, purchase any grapes so it means um, all the vines are coming from our vines and we are on a organic moving process because next year we will be able to to put organic uh, on the label i was very um, uh, for me it was very important to be in the vines today to show you something very rare. You have a very nice vine, you can see it, and you don't see any more grapes, no more grapes. And we are just on the 3 of September. So it's completely yeah. unique in our history. In the, in the last uh, 2000 years, we never had a so earlier um, vintage. It means we began the harvest on the 20th of August, and we finished the harvest three days ago. Imagine, we never heard this before. So it means that the, the warming global climate is very, very big concern. I, I know that in Australia, you have big fires. Here <clears throat> in Burgundy, it has been a, a, a blessing thing because when I was young, the main problem was to have ripe grapes. We were used to, to harvest at the end of September, um, mm. and little by little in the 20th, uh, the, the, the harvest date has moved uh, earlier and, and begin, began on the 20th of, of August. It was the first time for our history. Oh, okay. yeah. It's okay for you, everybody understand? Yeah. Fantastic. And Stefan, as, as you're talking at the moment, we're just exploring your cellars through Google Earth. Okay, so you are on the cellars. So you can see that the, the cellars of Chateau de Merceau are one of the most beautiful cellars in Burgundy. We are talking about uh, 12, 14, and 16th century cellars, very old cellars, uh, um, which are the best, the best place to age the wines. And when you visit the, the chateau, because um, we are one of the only places to be visited by tourism, because it's big place, big cellars. So, uh, People can uh, go across the cellars and you can see, uh, maybe I, I think on, the, on your screen, you can see the magnificence of the cellars, very large, and uh, we are able to put 2,000 barrels in the cellars. Okay? Um, that's okay for you, Luke? That is perfect, yes. Uh, let's move on now, let's move on the, on the wine. So, um, Merceau Charme, because you are, um, we are testing today uh, Merceau Charm. So Merceau Charm is uh, one of the two best premier cru you can have uh, on the you can have on the um, on Merceau Merceau Charm. Okay, and uh, um, it's Chardonnay wines. You know that in Burgundy we have two uh, two varietals: Pinot for the for the red wines and Chardonnay for the for the for the whites. So all the differences between the, the wines are just a question of what we call now the climat de Bourgogne, le, the terroir. The, the climat de Bourgogne have been classified by the UNESCO World War Patrimony uh, in 2015, uh, 16, 15, 15. Right, it's five years ago now. Um, just because in the last 2000 years, little by little, the monks and the duke have defined the differences between uh, the vines. And imagine that this one, this vine here, it's a premier cru level. It's up the hill, very well exposed to the sun, east exposition. 
like Alsace before. But if you go 500 meters away, you move just on a burgundy level. It means all the hierarchy is done on this, on the hill. Usually the Grand Cru and the Premier Cru are always in the middle of the slope. And you have regional appellation and village uh, uh, at the bottom. Okay. Is, that, is, is it clear for everybody? You're coming through clearly. Everybody, yes. Okay. That all, that all makes a lot of sense to me, mate. Okay, so um, Merceau Charme, it's quite easy because very often the names of the, of the cuvee uh, uh, are linked to their names. For example, Perrier, it comes from Pierre in French. Pierre means stones. Charme, it's very easy. It's come from charming. Uh, why charming? Because in the soil of Charme, so the Charme is just one, you can see the, this vine is Perrier and just uh, beside uh, me, uh, you have the beginning of Charm. Charm is 45 hectares altogether. And Chateau de Merceau is the first owner of Merceau Charm. We, we have about 4.7 4, 4 hectares of Charm. So the production can be around 20,000 uh, 20, bottles when it, when it works very well. So Charm, it means that the wines have a lot of Charm because of the clay, because of the soil. In the soil, you see, you can have um, uh, how do you say? If I if I show you the soil, you can see you can see um, stones, little stones. But also this part, this brown part, is it's clay, and the clay is going to give to the uh, to the um, to the wine a very very good map. And I think this is time now to to put uh, um, in your mouth. <laughs> <laughs> They already so have one and, uh, <laughs> I think, I think that, that happened a few minutes ago, definitely. Stefan, yeah. I think you have uh, better expectations if you think everybody could uh, withstand holding, uh, holding that one down. <laughs> that's, uh, many, uh, I think there might be a few top-ups going on right now as we speak, Stefan. That's fantastic. Mate, that was, that's, re that's really, really informative. Thank you very much. It's, yes. it's so Just, rare that we get the amazing opportunity to actually go into the vineyard and and i don't just mean via google maps i mean mm. actually in the vineyard and and on that note mark also going into the the cellars they they look absolutely amazing um i'd like to just bring in because i know he's got quite a bit of experience uh with these kind of wines uh michael again michael what is a so like this likely to do with say 10 years worth of age well, um, one of the perks of my job is that I get first look at a lot of these seller release consignment lines. And um, I had to do, you know, a, a pretty cautious and pretty careful uh, assessment of uh, a bottle of Merceau Premier Cru that came through recently. And um, it had a bit of age on it. And I noticed two things when I, whenever I drink aged white burgundy. So for me, I think that they develop both texturally and flavor, flavor wise. And the texture for me really starts to round out and you get a really heavy creamy character that comes through the wine, um, which is something that I really love, which is why I constantly get in trouble for spending too much money on white burgundy. Um, and then the second thing that I notice is that a lot of those kind of citrus uh, characters that marry with the acidity, they start to develop into kind of a buttery, nutty, kind of almondy character. Um, but that was a different estate. So I think it would probably be good to ask Stefan what Chateau de Merceau kind of turns into when it ages. And just quickly, Stefan, I noticed that there was one bottle down there that had an MM written in... Um, written in the dust. I'm assuming that bottle's being saved for me, yeah? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, maybe two words first about the vintage. We are talking about 16 vintage. 16 vintage, it's very, very special in Burgundy because we, we got a major frost day on the 27th of April, 2016. And uh, uh, we, we lost about uh, more than 50% of the production of all our vines. So it has been a terrible vintage for that. Uh, we got also some mildew, but uh, we got a very good, very good uh, summer time. And uh, finally, we harvest the charm on the, on the 21 of September. So it's uh, quite late vintage. Frost means when you have frost, um, uh, the vines take, uh, um, 
needs about two to three weeks to recover. It means uh, uh, after frost, everything is blocked, no more leaves. So to recover, it takes time. And uh, usually you have much more concentration in the grapes because uh, the production is smaller and uh, the berries are very are smaller. So um, here we are talking about 16 vintage um, and you, you are talking about the aging. I think today the wine is already um, uh, ready to be drunk, but uh, uh, we know that this very, very high level um, white bag and it can age very, very, very long. Uh, I used to be the CEO of Bouchard Perefis and uh, I used to drink a lot of wines coming from the 19th century. And Urso Charm, I remember that I, I drank a Merso Charm 1846, 1846, imagine. Uh, it's very special conditions when you have very good sellers, when you change uh, the cork uh, after 20 to 30 years, you can change the cork, you can refill uh, the bottle uh, um, to have always uh, a full bottle. And um, with these conditions, the best wines for, for the best vintages can be aged for almost forever. I say it's a, it's a key point. But uh, what I say usually is when you, when you buy 12 bottles of Charm, for example, the best way is to drink one very quickly, just to, to, to be sure that the wine is, is lovely. And uh, after year after year, you can open a bottle just to check and to see the evolution. If it's too young for you, you can wait. And if it's very good for you, you can drink the bottle. Uh, the key point is your taste and not mine taste. Some people love the, the, the very young wines, uh, others prefer with more age. Uh, but what is sure, a charm, you need at least three to four years before, uh, before beginning the tasting. Amazing. Is that, is that okay for you? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Very enlightening. And, and certainly, Stefan, just to let you know, we've, in the comments section, we're getting a, a lot of love on this particular wine. Um, again, really keen to, to open the floor up, uh, and um, I'm sorry for picking on people. Um, I don't know, I, Peter, Giorgio, what, what are your thoughts on this one? I know that you, you love uh, Merceau wines. Uh, <clears throat> if I could drink a Merceau bottle every week for the rest of my life, I'd be very, very happy. <laughs> well, we can help you. <laughs> yeah, Pete, uh, Pete, I'll meet you at your place. No worries. No worries. Uh, That's why we are so happy here. Because yes. it's a, we a every day. John, can I pick on you as well? What do you think of this one? Oh, you're on mute, John. You just have to unmute yourself. I think it's there sublime. I, th I think it's fantastic. It's a lovely, lovely wine. And I think that uh, if I drank it next year, it'd be even better and the year after it'd be even better. So I think it's, 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 it's a wine that I think is going to just keep developing and it's, it's, it's really lovely now though. Well, I'm glad I picked on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, good commentary. Thank you guys. From, uh, I, I can really see that, um, that, that complexity stuff in this wine. There's, there's kind of layer upon layer and every time I go back to the glass, I'm finding something new in there. It's, um, it's really, that's absolutely exceptional. So, Stefan, thank you so much, first of all, for, for making such a fantastic wine, of course, but also thank you for, uh, for, for being a part of this tonight. It's been so great to get your insights to, uh, to, to your winery. Beautiful wine. Yeah. Cheers. 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 Conte. Conte. Thank you so much, Conte. Stefan. Hope to Conte. see you one day in, in Burgundy. Yes, for sure. <laughs> right. Well, onwards and upwards. Almost sad to see that one go because it was such a beautiful drop. Um, but we've got another text in question. So moving into Beaujolais, the question is, which Thursday in November is Beaujolais Nouveau Day? Is it the first Thursday, the second Thursday, the third Thursday or the fourth Thursday? So again, name, email, the answer one, two or three or four uh, to, the, to the number below. I'll say second, you know. The so just, the just whilst people were texting in, um, we had a question to the experts from Nick. What food um, is likely to pair well with this? Something with a kind of buttery sauce or, or what would you guys recommend? Stefan, I might, um, I might hand that one to you. I know I, I, Stefan and I, I've, I've actually visited the Shadow of Merceau before. And I know Stefan's absolutely a fantastic 
um, pick of, 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 of what matches food, uh, food, what matches food with his wine. Stefan, what would be your, your preference? Um, I, I recommend, I, I love to drink charm with, first of all, I, I think the, the wine can be as aperitif by, by, by itself. It's very good alone. And regarding food, I'm going on a seafood, uh, seafood uh, products like uh, scallops or um, um, or omar, omar um, lobster. or lobster for sure lobster but just uh, you are you're not obliged to move on the on the very buttery sauce you can just because the, the white is already very very uh, it's, it's quite rich it's very fresh it's long fresh not heavy but rich so uh, we've uh, uh, just you know uh, um, lobsters uh, a la poêle lobsters um, on the, how do you say that? Just on the pan. On the pan, lobsters on the pan or scallops. Uh, we just maybe uh, a bit of um, um, oil, olive, uh, olive oil. Olive oil. Uh, I think it's, you need, you need to be simple, not, not because the wine is already uh, very, very uh, beautiful and comfortable in your mouth. So, uh, yeah, Michael's already ahead of the curve here. He's, he's had, uh, he's actually got scallops for dinner that he's matched this with. So that's absolutely perfect. Good idea. And then, and uh, Ali's got his croissant for uh, for breakfast to have with it. So just a buttery good. croissant, a buttery croissant with a glass of Merceau is not a bad thing. Maybe an almond croissant. There you go. It's true. Almond, almond croissant could be, a, yeah, it's very good breakfast. Ah, <laughs> there you go. Yeah. <laughs> So that leads us nicely to wine number three. Um, Ali, we're going to throw over to you to introduce the Jean-Paul Beaujolais. So before we do that, Luke, let's just get, um, let's just cover off. We, we finished with the, finished with this second question here. Yeah, uh, yeah I think we, we've had all of our texts in. Yep, beautiful. All right. When do we release the answer to that one? Now. We're going to release the answers when we spin the wheel. I'll let everybody know. Ah, okay. So we're allowed to um, talk about it. Okay, so I can give away the answer. Uh, now. You can give away the answer. Yeah, I realise it's answer, probably yes. quite pivotal to it. <laughs> okay, cool. So we're now going over to Beaujolais and an area that um, has, whose fortunes have changed quite a lot over the past few years. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about Jean-Paul Brun, but I often get asked, you know, what if you could only have one wine, you know, a desert island wine, um, uh, I tend to sort of deflect that question and go, I'd like a desert island region if I can. Um, and whilst most enophiles might say Burgundy, actually, I often lean towards Beaujolais. And that, that may surprise some people, but Beaujolais to me is just a wonderful, wonderful drink. It may not have the complexity all the time um, of, great, of great Burgundy, um, but what it does have now um, is why has Beaujolais become so popular? One of the things, the main reason is that Burgundy has become so expensive. Um, and some of the wines of Beaujolais, the great we're looking at here in Beaujolais is Gamay. Um, and there are several, uh, there are a lot of similarities between the two great varieties, but they're both fairly light, fairly refreshing. And the, looking at the question we just had, Beaujolais Nouveau, Nouveau which you, you all would have known um, about, um, kind of ruined the reputation of Beaujolais. Um, but over recent years, there's been a huge movement towards people making wines more in a Burgundian style than what was typical for Beaujolais, which was this process of carbonic maceration, producing these wines that were very fruity, quick to market, which is what Beaujolais Nouveau was. And that brings me to Jean-Paul Brun. Um, Jean-Paul Brun is uh, a little bit of a hero to me, actually. Um, and I first came across his wines by a master of wine called Mark Savage, who imports his wines to the UK. And I was very pleased to see that his wines were not represented in Australia. So we went over to see Jean-Paul, um, Mark and I, and it, I think Mark will agree with me. It's, he is really an incredible character. Um, he is seen as a bit of an anarchist. He's been making wines since 1977. Um, he eschewed or so he, he rebelled against the things that they do in Beaujolais. One, which is carbonic maceration that I've just talked about. He wants to make wines in these Burgundian style. Second, uh, thermovinification, a process of heating his wines up. Um, and thirdly, he uses natural yeast. So he is 
what I would call a natural winemaker, but not dogmatic. So he doesn't use much sulfur. Um, he's an incredible character. Um, and he's been doing it this way since 1977. And again, his wines are incredibly affordable. So this is his entry level wine, Le Rancé. This is the 2018. Um, 2018 was a very, very warm vintage. Um, we had the 2017, which I'm sure many of you might have tried. This is a slightly riper, richer style of, um, of Beaujolais than, his, than this 2017. And this comes from the south of Beaujolais, from granite slopes and from limestone slopes, which I'm going to talk about a little bit in a minute. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. This is one of my favourite, favourite everyday drinking wines. Mark, I'm just going to ask you, what, when you first met Jean-Paul, what were your thoughts? I'll take you off mute, my hat. Yeah, sorry about that. That's quite important. So what, one thing I'll just add in a little anecdote that, um, that, I, that really, really surprised me when I first met Jean-Paul Brun, because in, here in Australia, we have had a very, very minute pinhole vision into Beaujolais. And I remember when I was studying wine, when I was uh, throughout the years, one of the most famous things I learned about Beaujolais was the, the hilarious decree of Philip the Bold, which was in 1395. And he called Beaujolais, it was a, uh, a disloyal variety. Philip the Bold was a Burgundian and he legitimately, he, he banned the growth of the Gamay grape within the boundaries of Burgundy. He, he, was, he hated it so much and he thought it was such a bad grape variety that he banned it from Burgundy, from the, the, the northern section of Burgundy. So, of course, it was forced down into the section which we now know as Beaujolais onto the granite soils and that's where it's found its, its home now. But from, from that, a lot of people kind of, I thought as a, as, a, as a person, a young person studying wine, I thought to myself, well, God, how, you know, how good, how good can this be? This is, you know, it's been kicked out of Burgundy. But I think it's more just the fact that it hadn't found the right spot. And, and Ali mentioned granite soils, which we're going to talk about a bit later. But I, I had such, an, such a kind of small view of Beaujolais. And when I met Jean-Paul Bruin and when I went to this vineyard, uh, it was just incredible to see what this man's doing with this grape variety. And it just made me think, God, why are we not drinking more of this style of wine? Yeah, so, yeah. Absolutely. absolutely. And I think that they, they are, uh, and again, look at Mark Savage, the, the master of wine who introduced me to this. He said another thing that he was a bit of a mentor to me and still is, Mark said to me, the first duty of every wine, and I may have said this before to you guys, is to be refreshing. And that is what Beaujolais does so well. It has just an abundance of, of acidity, freshness and vibrancy. Um, and, you know, we talked about the affordability now of, of Beaujolais. And if you look, they have, in Beaujolais, you have the, the Beaujolais Village, which is the entry level wine, as much as you do in, in, in Burgundy. And then you have this, this, the crews, uh, such as Morgan, Fleury, um, uh, the, the, the Regine, there's quite a few of them. I think there's nine, is there nine or 11 crews in Beaujolais? Uh, the there's nine. nine Julien Archenaz, Moulin Avant, Fleury, Chiroud, Morgan, Renier, Morgan. Côte de Brie. Yeah. Nine. Is that, is that Brie? Yeah, yeah, that's right. And so, but those, there is where we find these granite soils that we're going to talk about um, in a minute. But what you'll find now is there are quite a lot of top Burgundy estates when we went to Domaine AF Grow who have now bought land in the crews of Burgundy as well, in, of Beaujolais as well, because they're seeing A, that affordability, and B, that they're not that far off in, um, in, in, in quality as, as a lot of the Burgundy. Um, did we have, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about granite soils. Have we had any questions so far to answer before I go into that? I think we are good. I'm just going to... Sorry, Alice, there are a couple of um, comments which are, are really good whilst Mark is pulling the screen there. Um, Nick said, very surprisingly, not a crew, um, but uh, earthy Beaujolais, well-balanced, if not carbonic, still seems to have a whole bunch, at least in part. Delicious. That's a fantastic tasting note. Thank you for that. 
Um, yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, this is, uh, I don't know how much, what is this, and, 25, 30, dollars that we sell yeah. this for? Um, and, and again, Kerry's kind of reiterated that saying, um, you know, it's a, it's a nice wine. It's something that you can drink easily. And I, when I kind of talk to my clients about this wine, I think it's perfect to pitch it as something that you drink, you know, on a Sunday afternoon where you just want something nice to drink that's not got too much kind of hard shoulders or anything like that. And it's just easy and, and, and nice to, to enjoy. And yeah. I, would, I would strongly recommend as well um, going, going forward, as, as we have seen, I mean, here in New South Wales, we had a very, very, very warm day. We got up to 29 degrees. As we do get into these warmer, warmer temperatures, I mean, I, I've just had this in the fridge for an hour. And it's it's absolutely beautiful. It it really it really brings out the freshness and that that satisfaction, that crunchiness in the wine. So I strongly suggest, uh, I strongly encourage you to do that. Yeah, definitely. These are wines that that benefit from just a little chill, twenty minutes, half an hour um, in the fridge, just to take that 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 um, to, to to really exacerbate that freshness and show it. Um, I think the. The 2018, as I said, this was a really, really, really warm year. So the 2018 we've got now is a slightly atypical La Ronce. Normally there's a little bit more crunch and freshness, um, but I just want to touch on that crunch and freshness and, and what I love and what are the things that, that, that um, has made me choose Beaujolais as my desert island region is a lot to do with these granite soils that I've talked about. And there's many regions, uh, some of the other regions that I love most in the world, the northern part of the Rhone Valley, um, Bieso uh, in, in Spain, where they're making amazing Mencia, a region of, called Itata in the, south of, in the south of Chile, famous for its granite soils. And this, without going too deeply into soils, um, it's not always proven, or it isn't proven, that you can taste minerality or taste nutrients or minerals in a wine. But... I certainly from wines on granite slopes can detect what I would call a crunchiness, a freshness. Um, and the same with limestone and granite soils, they tend to have slightly higher pH um, in the soils. And that seems to exacerbate and really show the acidity and what we will call minerality in these wines. Um, also, I think one of the functions of soil is that the way it conducts heat to the vine. And granite soils get very warm during the day, but during the nighttime, they cool down very quickly. And that helps maintain that level of acidity as well. And if, if you have higher acidity, also the tannins become slightly less um, perceptible. So there is just a pure, incredible angularity and vibrancy to a lot of the wines that I find um, that come from granite. And they can take longer to open up as well. So they also have um, longevity as well. Um, so there's my little thing on granite soils. And I urge you to buy more Burgundy, to buy more Beaujolais, sorry. I know we have some of the crews from, from Jean-Paul and for very little money in comparison with, with Beaujolais, they are Burgundy, they are really, really worth looking at. So maybe Mark, Luke, we can send out a list of those wines um, because oh. they're, they're very dear to my heart. And I think if you're a Burgundy fan, it's the way to start looking for really affordable options. We, um, we actually, we, so we, we originally, we brought in just two of, of Jean-Paul Bourne's um, crew Good. wines. And we're now going to expand that out to four because the two that we had just just went so fast. <laughs> so we sold, fast. We're sold out already, are we? Yeah, mate, we sold out. We sold out so quick. It was just okay. incredible. Well, so, we'll get um, more then. We'll get we'll get more in and send out a note to everyone here, and then hopefully they can they can they can see what we're talking about because they really are wines that, um, that 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 should be drunk, and the price is only going to go up of these wines. And, and that's that's the absolute. I mean, you, you see the the Burgundians, as you said, Burgundians buying land in in Beaujolais that means that the prices just will will go only one direction so yeah yeah absolutely and then we've got a question here from Rod are we seeing a move away from carbonic um, maceration in the Beauj in Beaujolais we're seeing certainly with some producers yes we are seeing um, them going towards a more Burgundian style um, and not just relying on carbonic certainly for the wines from from the crews and that's uh, something that Jean-Paul um, does you know is is very um, passionate about moving away from carbonic so we've we've basically answered this question here with that uh with that question there from um from from rod so what what historically has been the process here is is carbonic maceration and it's it's so interesting to it's i mean first of all i think that that definitely has its place carbonic maceration has its place in winemaking and it is a fascinating 
thing to study the 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 process of carbonic maceration. However, I, I must say that I, I definitely prefer the way John Paul Brun is doing what he is doing, kind of emulating that Burgundian style, which is not necessarily emulating Burgundian style. It's emulating kind of every style of winemaking that's just not carbonic maceration. So, um, but I, I just thought I'll just say a few words on carbonic because it is. It is definitely, it is the most famous way of making, or the most popular way of making wine within the region of Beaujolais. So it has to kind of be mentioned, even though we're not really tasting it here. But this is a fascinating image that I found just to give you an, an indication of, of what it does, of what carbonic maturation does. Basically, the grapes are kept in a, in a tank under, under pressure. And what it does is it's, it starts what's called intercellular fermentation. So within each individual berry, some, the, the, the fermentation process starts in a very, very small manner. And what that does is it actually takes the, uh, the, some of the flavor and also the color from the skins and it, and it bleeds into the pulp of the, of, the, of the berry. Now you'll see here, this is just a normal gamay berry. And you'll see the, the fruit, the flesh is actually quite clear. And so when you, as with most grape varieties, there's only a few that are not, when you, when you press the grapes, the, the juice runs very, very clear. That first press is very, very clear. And in red wines, you need to macerate them on the skins to get that color into it. So basically what this process is doing is doing that maceration before crushing. So you're getting the color and you're getting the flavor, but you're not getting the tannin. So it's just, a, it's a very, very interesting process of, of making wines. There's been a question, which has been a, a really good one, actually, from uh, Team Leg, uh, about which animals or insects in the area, and I guess we could expand it to, to Burgundy as well for Stefan, uh, pose most of a, a kind of risk or a, or a threat to the vines and the fruit. Uh, Animals or insects in um, Beaujolais, Burgundy. Uh, one of the problems I know that they, they've had problems with with esca, um, which is which is fungal, I believe. They've also had a problem with flavescence dure, which um, I think is a disease that starts in the nurseries but is then spread by little insects called leaf hoppers um, in the vineyard, um, and that was a big problem in Beaujolais um, for a while. Of course, the other problems. That they have our, our frost is, is can be a big problem um, there as well. Um, doo -doo 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 -doo. What else has one, there been? One, Ali, if, if I might hop, uh, just jump in quickly, one of I know one of the biggest issues that they've had within Beaujolais because this is within all of France. This is the most uh, monocépagiste, so one of the it, it, it's one of the only grape varieties where they have kind of one grape variety, and everyone grows the same grape variety. There's no variation. There's, I mean, there are little pockets where you might find a bit of Chardonnay or a bit of Pinot Noir, but by and large, it is it is one hundred percent Gamay throughout the entire region. So, one of the, I know um, talking with a winemaker several years ago, they were saying that the issue is that when when you do get a, a fungal disease or something does come in, it doesn't matter what it really is. If something hits one, it hits all of them because they're all yeah. basically carbon copies of each other they're all brother and sister vines so that's yeah. one of the that's one of the things that, that they don't have a, a separation of uh that they're not kind of split their wrist if you know what i mean yeah so, yeah yeah um fantastic and just being slightly conscious of time if you guys can give us your, your best 30 second answer to this i'm not sure if it's possible um what is carbonic maceration <laughs> ali 30 seconds <laughs> <laughs> oh, so you want me to answer that in 30 seconds? Okay, very quick, 30 questions. Carbonic maceration is essentially where you put all of the grapes um, and, in, and stems in together in a tank and they undergo, you close the tanks and they undergo an intracellular fermentation, uh, which basically means that they start fermenting within the berry themselves and the resulting, the resulting wine tends to be very fruit led, very fruit driven. It can often have sort of quite what they call estuary characters of, of banana um, and pear drop characters. So it's just a, a way of getting very, very juicy, not so tannic wines um, and wines that you can get to market very quickly. Fantastic. And 
Ali, I think this is a nice lead in to wrap up. We're going to tackle question number two first because I think it is quite a pivotal part of uh, Beaujolais. The question was, which Thursday uh, is Beaujolais Nouveau Day? Firstly, if you could do another 30 second attempt to explain Beaujolais Nouveau Day. Uh, and then secondly, uh, I can give the answer. Beaujolais Nouveau, uh, the answer, oh, I won't give the answer then quite yet. Beaujolais Nouveau uh, was something uh, that was pioneered by, pushed by a man called Georges Duboeuf, who was the master of Beaujolais Nouveau. Essentially, it was, it became trendy in the uh, 70s, 80s, I should think, probably yeah, the 80s. Late now. 70s, early 80s. The, yeah. Late 70s, early 80s, where it became a race to get the wine to market um, from Beaujolais, first of all, into the taverns in Lyon and then into Paris. Then it became a global phenomenon. Who could get their wine first? And it would be drunk on the ex particular Thursday of November and that was Beaujolais Nouveau Day everyone had big parties and drank and celebrated the first wine of that season fantastic so the third Thursday of third. November right. so well done to everybody who got that right and then just to cover off whilst we're getting the wheel of wine ready uh, question number one which was wh basically which was Napoleon's favoured uh, Burgundian uh, appellation and it was the wines of Chambaton. Yeah, Apparently no. he was quoted with saying um, <clears throat> nothing makes the future look so rosy as to contemplate it through a glass of Chambaton um, and I'm sure most of the United Sellers crew would agree with that. Um, I Definitely think. agree with that one. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. So I'm just going to grab the wheel of wine. Uh, well done to everybody who, who texted in and, and thanks again. We always appreciate your answers. Give me just two six. Is everybody seeing that? Yep. So there's a lot of answers. So thanks, of answers here. thanks again. That's all going into the leaderboard for next week. So well done and, and good luck for the leaderboard. I'm going to give it a spin. I think we're going to have a new leader in the genre this next week. Well done, Richard. Richard, beautiful. Michael, that was so close. I'm sorry. <laughs> so close. <laughs> so, well done. So, Stefan, I know you're going to stay with us for the breakout room wine. Um, everybody else is more than welcome to stay in the Zoom room. I know that Michael is hanging around if you have any questions for him. If not, you can, you can get him on email and I know that Jane will be staying in in the main room as well so please feel free to, to open up and and conversate as you like I'm just going to open up the breakout room now a final little word from me um I've, I've actually I've just managed to secure Nick Mills the winemaker of Ripon one of my favorite New Zealand producers wow um on Thursday the 1st of October he'll be walking us through some of his wines I've just that put that online today uh, there'll be some adverts going out soon, so if anyone's interested, please do, uh, please do jump on. And I should mention also, just to reiterate, if you guys are interested in the meal pairs, I'm going to be sending out an email after we jump off the Zoom call today. Just reply back to me with the amount of orders that you'd like to make, and we can make that happen. We will need to hear relatively soon, just to, just to make sure we get it to you guys in time. Fantastic. So I'm just going to open up room number two now. All right, guys. Thanks so much for coming. Brilliant. Thank you all very much indeed. Great to see everyone. We'll see you next week. It was a very, very good and very earliest, uh, early vintage. We, we began the harvest on the, um, the 1st of September, which is very early too. And... Um, from the beginning to the end, it was very easy to, to, to manage that vintage, not, not too much disease, good, uh, good weather conditions, and uh, no, um, no, no, on the sorting table, nothing to sort. So uh, little by little, we, we have been convinced from the beginning that the 15 vintage should be a great one. And uh, uh, definitely, I think uh, uh, everybody knows that, that because when you see the, the, the wine list on the restaurants, you, you don't have any more 15 vintage. It's very it's becoming very rare to have 15 vintage on the wine list because everybody uh, has wanted to, to drink the wines. Okay. Mm -hmm.
correct for you? You hear me well, yeah? Yeah, I think Mark's on mute. Mark's again on mute. I think um, absolutely yeah. perfect, we Stefan. Yeah, we got you, we got you perfectly. You, you just can't hear me because I put myself on mute. So um, maybe if so we maybe, can, um, maybe if we can go, yes, maybe and I maybe can do a, a small presentation. Yes, Sorry, a bit of a bit of a delay here. Okay, uh, so the, the, just to show you. Um, the Puligny Moraché Chancanet is not that far away from here, just two, 200 meters. You can see maybe at the first, uh, um, uh, at the, just you can see the, the trees uh, just yeah. behind the vines. And, and just be, behind the trees, you are on the Puligny Moraché side. So it means from Perrier, where we are now, to Chancanet, we are talking about. Uh, uh, two to three hundred meters, so it's very close to here. That's why the the Chancanet is the the northest um, premier cru of 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 Puligny. You have Chancanet, Les Combettes, and um, and Les Refaires. Uh, here you just have the Les Combettes from Prieur, very famous. Is is as um, the richness that you can find in Merceau. So it's very um, uh, floral, a lot of flower in the in the nose, but you also have uh, this density and the the, the 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 smart that gives you uh, a comfortable approach, I would say. So the the Pulinichon Canet from Chateau de Merceau. Chateau de Merceau has uh, the, the luck to have uh, one uh, almost one hectare, half an hectare, zero point five eight, uh, and uh, we produce around. Uh, uh, 2,000, 2,500 bottles a year because it's a very, very old vine. We are talking about six, 60 years old vine, so it's very old. And um, it gives very small grapes and very small berries. And it, it, that's why the, 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 the Chancanet is so concentrated. We have a, a dry extract in, in the mouth, uh, which is very spectacular. It's a very, very long, long mouth uh, wine. And, and uh, it's wine for aging without any problem for, for decades, for years and years. Even if you can drink it earlier, it's a wine to, to keep in your cellars uh, if you have time to, to do that. Fantastic. I'm really keen to open up the floor and, and, and get uh, a bit of a, a conversation going. I wonder, John, um, obviously you're, you're trying these wines. What are your thoughts on, on this particular one? Oh, there, there was the reason why I um, signed up for the uh, for the extra the extra bottle it was uh, for this wine. Uh, it's it's uh, absolutely um, fan delicious. The question I've got is really of the last ten vintages. What do you uh, regard as the best vintage? <laughs> Uh, uh, in white, in white, uh, let's take, let's talk about the whites. So the whites, uh, in my cellar, for example, I have some 14 vintage because I considered that the, the balance of the 14 uh, was absolutely uh, unusual, spectacular. Uh, 15 vintage um, in whites, it's a bit richer, a bit warmer, but very. Um, uh, very comfortable, very easy to drink already. Uh, you have more energy in the 14. Um, 16, I, I talked about the 16 before, uh, a lot of concentration, a bit, a bit colder. So it means not so lovely on the nose, but very, um, very um, tight uh, vintage. And um, 17 is a, a bit very similar to 14. So it's a great vintage uh, in whites. Um, 18 vintage has been very um, surprisingly because at, from the beginning of 18 vintage, everybody knows that the, the reds uh, would be very, very, it would be a great vintage for the reds. And a lot of people thought that maybe it would be too ripe for the whites. And we saw after the aging uh, that little by little, uh, the 18 vintage has a very, very high level of uh, vibration that means um, a lot of energy in the white and I think the 18 vintage is a good surprise on the on on the on the white side uh, thank you is that okay for you thank you what's your favorite 
my favorite to, today, I, lo I love the 18 vintage today. Uh, it's on the fruit side, it's absolutely spectacular. Uh, and I would say I will, I will open an 18 vintage for the aperitif and I will open a, a 17 or 14 uh, for the, to, 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 to eat. Uh, yep. Thank you. Me. Now, Stephen, you, you told me um, that you, you've walked the vineyards and, and been to the chateau. Um, what are your impressions of this wine? We're, we're mute. <laughs> I am also Stephen. Uh, my name is Stefan. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> <I> cannot... <laughs> there we go. Oh, no. Oh, Perhaps we can we can throw it over to, to Peter. Peter, what are your thoughts? Sorry, I got to remember to unmute. <laughs> um, yeah, well, you know, I was saying before about the Montreche. I mean, Coligny Montreche, <laughs> Chassan Montreche, Batar Montreche. Every day of the year, please. <laughs> 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 Yeah, that's good enough for me. <laughs> uh, Stephen, Stephen, subscription you coming your way. <laughs> <laughs> Stephen, I think we've got you off mute now. Oh, thank you. Um, I, I think the, two, the comment from the gentleman before and the comment earlier from John uh, pretty well summarises it nicely for me. This is just a wonderful, wonderful Chardonnay. Congratulations. Just a beautiful wine. Um, and quite unique in its style. I really like the balance. Um, very, very interesting balance between the fruit and the kind of oak, a sort of landland that's playing out in the oak. I really like the style, but it's much more, for me, more fruit dominant than the first wine. The first wine tended to be a little bit more oak than fruit, where this one, the fruit really sparkles. And I, I get this wonderful texture in my mouth. Texture, I think it's a texture, texture. Wine. Your maybe texture. I can. Maybe I can. Maybe I, I can maybe add I, something. I can add something regarding the process we are talking about of um, eighteen months of aging. Uh, it's about thirty percent of new oak, and um, um, we have been very proud because the the Puligny Chancanet eighteen vintage uh, I just scored uh, the best knot in the Burgundy uh, magazine. Uh, um, Bourgogne Aujourd'hui, which is the very famous wine magazine, wine magazine in Burgundy. And we just scored uh, the best of with the Puligny Moraché Chancanet 18 vintage. Uh, and, um, and regarding the texture, uh, I insist on the one tack we have changed uh, when I arrived at the chateau. Um, everything is, is done by hand, harvested by hand. But um, what we are focused on is to try to avoid any filtration um, before bottling. Uh, as you know, most of the, most of the white uh, wines uh, before bottling are filtrated because you can have uh, tartric uh, precipitation and some sediments. And uh, a lot of countries doesn't like at all to have uh, some sediments like United States, for example. So because I'm convinced that uh, avoiding um, Filtration is much better for the wines because you keep, uh, you keep the flesh, you keep the tannins, you keep a lot of things. Uh, to do that, we have tried to, uh, to have very long aging process in barrels. And before bottling, we put all the barrels together in a big, in a big stainless tank. And uh, instead of bottling very quickly, we wait two to three or three and a half months. So most of the wines, uh, um, is absolutely clear for you. Um, that how and, and you talked a little bit about oak and and barrels there. Have you um, changed your oak regime? Are you using less new oak now than before, or is that something that you've changed over the years? Um, first of all, when we arrived, we have changed most of the uh, of the um, oak producers. Uh, today we are working with François Frère, Dami, Taranso, and um, we organize every year a tasting blind competition with the, all the commercials um, because um, most of the people, they don't know exactly uh, what they sell. And uh, 
little by little, uh, we have defined the right bowel for the right plot. It means, um, for sure, it's uh, 30%, around 30% of New York, and no more than two, um, two years old bowels. Uh, in some winery, you can have bowels uh, of five, six, seven years. Uh, I think after three years, uh, it can be dangerous and you can have some uh, bad, bad taste with uh, old bowels. So yeah. um, every year we, we, we adjust, um, we are just doing this now for the for 20th vintage because we are, we are putting the, the wine in the barrels right now for the whites. And so after tasting, you, you have to imagine if you need more or less uh, uh, new oak uh, regarding the, for example, this year it's very rich, a lot of alcohol. So I'm not going to reinforce um, with too much uh, uh, new oak. So maybe this year it would be a bit less than a bit more. Uh, if you are, for example, the 16, 16 vintage, it was maybe a good way to, to put two or three percent more. Yeah, that's great. Thank you very much. Very helpful. You understand? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. And maybe I can I can uh, come back again about organic side. So Chateau de Merceau, it's 100 plots. So it's a lot of plots. And uh, we have decided to move on organic process. And next year, we will become uh, the, the largest estate in organic in Côte d'Or. Because, you know, to be to be uh, Organic, it's very easy when you have one or two plots or three or four hectares. But to manage um, 100 plots, it's much more complex because you need to be able to, uh, to treat um, the, the vines just in one day. Uh, and uh, when I arrived, it, it, took, it took three days and a half to, to treat all the vines. Today, we are able to do that in one day. So it means a lot of tractors, a lot of people to take care of the vines. But uh, I'm convinced that uh, uh, it's absolutely necessary to be organic and to, to don't have any more chemicals, um, uh, chemicals products on your leaves. Uh, because, you know, when you pay a very, very expensive bottle, uh, I can't imagine to be, uh, be non-organic, you know. So I think this is a new way of, any, of, of taking care of the vines. And... Um, the key point is how we, we are going to do to, to reduce the, um, the, 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 the working soil. soil uh, you know, when you move on the organic side, uh, as you can see in the vines, it, it's a very high density vines. We are talking about of 10,000 plants per hectare. This is the highest density in the world in Burgundy. And um, we, need, uh, we need to to work the soil very often when you are in organic process and uh, it's not very good um, it's not very good with the global warming climate because uh, you lose a lot of water so little by little we are one of the first to do that we are moving on uh, cover crops uh, we are we are planting beside uh, the rows we we put some uh, cover crops uh, with um, wheat uh, of one um, oh. uh, oat Oat, 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 yeah. oat uh, um, uh, sarazins, uh, come on, uh, wheat, oh, um, um, oats, poshy, peas, peas, uh, legumes, uh, legumes, legumes. Yeah. exactly. And so this is legumes. absolutely new um, in in uh, in Burgundy, but uh, we are we are doing that with uh, Domaine Le Fleve and Comte Lafont, and we share our experiences to to be able to have much better resilient soil because with the, this spectacular heat we have got uh, uh, last summer it's becoming very dangerous you can see if you see my feet um, you know it's very unusual uh, you see that it's very unusual to see uh, death mm. leaves uh, in the rows at this uh, at this time of the year you know so it's on, the leaves on the third of are, September, are yeah. burnt by the sun you know uh, mm. so uh, we, we have decided to move on a much more resilient process uh, in, in, the, in the vine. So we, we are going to, to have higher, higher plant. You know, we move on, on this side. 
so you have more leaves to cover the to cover the grapes, and uh, and this cover crop uh, is going to um, uh, increase the the soil the capacity of the soil to uh, to resist to the big 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 hits. Thank you, Stefan. I'm very very keen yeah, to uh, to keep track of of how how it all goes for you guys, and I think especially as, as you started this entire conversation with how, how interesting it was and how, um, how rare it was that you guys have finished harvest in August, which has never, never, never happened before in the history of Burgundy. That's incredible. I think, it's, I think you guys are on the right path to, um, to be able to face that. So, yeah, it's fantastic. It's because I have a very, very good team working hard and so... I just, I have nothing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Let's oh, you give, and, you and give very some, good, uh, you give very good Zoom presentations in the vineyard, Stefan. So we appreciate it. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. So it was really a pleasure. Next time, I really hope that it will be, uh, in French, we said, en chair et en os. It means with you uh, physically present. Uh, because um, just maybe two words about the virus today, the virus in Burgundy, uh, the media uh, talking about virus, but we don't see we don't see any virus. You know, it's quite. Uh, I think it's a very big, uh, uh, big concern. The media are much, too much focus on. It's a world. Uh, uh, it's a world media problem. I think today because uh, we don't have that. It's not so so um, uh, important. I think it's we have to take care about that. But you know, all the children are masked. Uh, I think it's it's too much. This is my opinion. It's, uh, <laughs> I'm convinced it's a bit too much. It stops you from uh, from drinking from drinking a glass. So you know. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, okay, and so... I hope to see you soon. And thanks, very, thank you very much to United Sellers. Uh, this is my first Zoom uh, with you. I hope it will be not the last one. Uh, I'm really really ready to do other ones because I think it's. Uh, it's a key point to, 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 to stay in touch together. And uh, thank you to Pure Wine and to, to Rob, to Tim and uh, everybody uh, who has organized uh, and Mark. And uh, so thank you very much and hope to see you very, very soon uh, in Merceau. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Stefan. Thank you, Stefan. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you, team. Bye. Fantastic. So th thanks again to everybody. Um, I know that we really enjoyed this tasting. I think it's been one of the most enjoyables with the wines and obviously Stefan in the, in the vineyard. And, and yeah, it's been a, a great experience. So we all very much look forward to seeing everybody for week three, which again promises to be quite special. Uh, Mark, Ali, do you have any finishing statements you'd like to add? That was, uh, that was, that was great. It was great. I loved it. But I, how cool was that seeing him in the vineyard? I mean, it just... Yeah, I think that was brings, spectacular. Really game changer. It, it really brings it to life. And I think, yeah. um, I, you know, if, if, if we can see more people in the vineyards, I think it's really instructive. And um, it, it, it made me thirsty. It made me want to be there. It really brings everything to life. Um, and in such a beautiful region, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty jealous now that he's there. We're only just over the channel and it's grey and miserable here in England. Who'd have thought... Who would have thought ice, England's grand miserable? Ice Valley? You what? Isn't that the starting point every day? Yeah, yeah, pretty much, pretty much. i got to say, it looked spectacular in the vineyard. I mean, it looked amazing. It looked yeah. beautiful, didn't it? And Pete, what did you think? You know, transporting yourself there to the vineyard? Uh, it's amazing. You know, without, without being able to travel, we, we were meant to be in Europe this year, and seeing that right now in the vineyard, that was just magic. That was fantastic. Yeah. Mm, yeah what makes you want to be there, right? Well, we're going to try and get there next year. That's for sure. Yeah, well, we're all going to be there. Mm. Steve? Uh, well, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to be in the Rhone Valley doing some um, on primer Probably. tasting yeah. for, for Genesis Robinson. And I will be, <laughs> if I can go there at the beginning of October, mm. I'll be doing a, a, a load of videos to send over to you guys to... Um, to see me in the in the we'll have to do a, a live Rhone on premier tasting, Ali. Well, we can try and do something like that. Certainly, of me in the vineyards and talking about it. And I can, you know, I, fingers crossed. If I can, if I can go, I'll be tasting in Chateau Rias. I'll be in in um, 
some of the greatest you know names there, Claude Pap. Um, but fingers crossed, it's all dependent on whether the, the coronavirus allows me to go and um, and do it. But if so, beginning of October, I'll be sending over some updates and um, a few shots yeah. in the vineyards. That you guys, we can send that to you guys. Yeah, John, what are your thoughts on this? the wines tonight? Oh, fantastic. I really was really looking forward to tonight. I, I, I was quite familiar with the first wine, but uh, the second the, the second wine we, we, and, it's, and, and obviously the one that we've just tried, I hadn't tried previously and they were outstanding. They, they were definitely up to the expectations that I was hoping for. And um, I'm looking, I bought, I've already bought a couple of others of, of the uh, vintage. So I'm looking forward to, to next year and the year after to, to crack them. Just remember got some to drink small <laughs> Steve, what was your thoughts on the last one? I think you're on mute. Oh, still on mute. Here we go. There you go. Here we go. Uh, look, I, I thought the last one was just a, a fabulous wine, but I thought to actually get to try the two of them alongside of each other. Mm -hmm. um, I did a, a very um, worthwhile um, uh, case study. Um, the charm we've tried a few times from different um, um, domains, but I think uh, his charm, 16, was, was absolutely superb. But, um, but the charm canard was just, just an extraordinarily really good wine, just an amazingly good wine. I think it just had so much better um, balance, much more fruit-led than, than kind of oak-led, uh, oak butter led which, of course, was the charm. So I just thought it was a, excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you very much. Great. All right. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Um, as as I say every week, it's fantastic to be able to do this with you digitally, if not personally. Um, this has been such a great learning experience. I think this has definitely been one of our one of our best events so far. Um, and thank you so much to my team for a fantastic job again. Um, thanks to Ali over in uh, in the UK. Um, thanks, guys. Continue on with the Riesling for breakfast. Uh, good on you, mate. Um, <laughs> I, might, I might put it in. I might put it in the fridge and have it tonight with my. With, I might try and do a bit of exercise, but um, but it will definitely be be drunk later. As I think the both question, Ali, yeah. which was the best wine to pair with the croissant? <laughs> yeah, oh, man, it's it's got to be Merso all day long. It's got to be Merso all, all day long. It's the, it's the way to work that. Yeah, all, all morning and all night. Day. Yeah, he, he agreed with me. So actually, I'd love to hear from you guys as well. Um, maybe have a think about it in next week. Let us know any other in-depth tastings or other wines or regions, John Peters, you know, that you'd be interested in in learning about. Um, we can look at some private sessions of some really top-end wines. Just, you know, have a think and, and um, that, that would be something I'd love to hear back and maybe we could organise something in the future for a really small group of, of looking at some, some top end wines and getting some top winemakers in as well. That would yeah. be pretty fun. Absolutely. And, and, and honestly, I mean, we, we started, I, I, I built this tasting based entirely off someone asking if we could do a, a French course after the Italian course. So it's, it's this, yeah. I mean, the, the sky, yeah, exactly. It was you, Stephen. So, um, you know, the sky's the limit. Whatever, whatever we want to do, we, we can do. So just, just let us know. Exactly. I'd love to, you know, join in. And if there's anything, yeah, I'll have, I'll have a think about things and put them to you. It'd be, it'd be fun to, um, to do some, I, these little small groups where we can really get interactive feedback and discuss the wines and intricacies would be cool. And we could call in some fun winemakers and do maybe a really high end little one. That'd be fun. Mm. Another good way to start the day. <laughs> exactly. If you aren't going to do that, I'd be particularly interested only because Alistair, you talked before about Reyes. I mean, anything in the Chateau Neuf area, I mean, has a great deal of interest for myself. Okay, well, that, that's, let's see what we can do. Getting, getting Ryan might, might pose a few <laughs> problems. <laughs> in Australia but, gets but, three bottles every year. <laughs> so. Ellie, yeah. uh, can we get I reckon, I reckon you could sell it within this, this floor as we speak, so. I may, you know what, I may, it's frustrating because I was hoping to be in in Australia to see you guys and do some tastings next month October, um, but obviously there's 
that that's not happening. And I was hoping to smuggle in a few bottles of something like that to do an intimate tasting with you guys. But um, but we can I can certainly look at sourcing a few bottles of Michael B. Rias, but maybe I don't know some homage or Jacques Perrin or something that we could I could get and send over and see if we could do something. So I, I'll I'll have a look also, at Chateau. We also have. Um, we've got a, a, a container arriving on Tuesday, which has got some fantastic um, Chardonnay in there as well. So we can definitely have a have a chat about that. Yeah, some and um, yeah, some Alain Jean, some um, yeah. Have we got some Vieux Donjon as well coming in? Uh, Alain Jean, Alain Jean. Okay, just Alain Jean, not Vieux Donjon as well. Okay, well, and I will I'll see if I get to go to Rias, in which I'm pretty excited about in a few weeks. Then I will I'll do some sweet talking and see if I can get if I can um, get a few bottles. I don't know if that will work, but I'll see. <laughs> 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 Ten bottles, Anthony. So, yeah, Ten but, um, will be the start. <laughs> I'll start with enough. I'll start with one. I'll, I'll start with yeah. one. We'll yeah, build yeah. up from there. That's what we we'll start, start with one. one. Yeah. Yeah. We're all ready. I'll see what I can do, but I'll have a think about that and see if I can source anything over here. Um, you know, it's not going to be cheap, but of course we all know that. But let, let me let me have a look. I'm so do. My project for the day. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thank you, everybody, and um, again, we're really looking forward to next week already. So, um, looking forward to seeing you there. Cheers, guys. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Cheers, Thank you very much. Next week. Good night. <laughs>